All right, session two, session five, part two, quasi-experimental designs. This lecture covers the readings in Rubin and Babby's research methods for social work, and it comes out of chapter 12 in the eighth edition. Today I will be going over and give my take on quasi-experimental designs. Also, dis different types of comparison group designs that compare non-equivalent groups. Also, simple and multiple time series designs, cross-sectional studies, case control studies, and a little bit about doing experiments and experimentation in social services agencies. In the previous lecture, where we had discussed experimental designs, we covered a lot of ground that is equally applicable to the quasi-experimental design. In fact, the primary differentiating factor in my mind between the experimental design and the quasi-experiment design is either the lack of a ran ability to randomly assign subjects to your study <clears throat> and or it is not feasible to have a control group. So look at the diagram at the bottom of this slide. You can see the similarity between the experimental design. And in fact, had these two groups been randomly selected from the same population, it could be an experimental design. But for whatever reason, there, were, there are two groups that are being compared, one to the other. We believe them to be similar, but we can't bank on that because we either didn't have enough to randomly select or they were already existing uh, groups. Typically, what we would see in an evaluation of the, oh, say a new intervention in a social services agency, is that we have two existing groups. Perhaps they're being managed by uh, separate teams or service units, <clears throat> and we have trained uh, Team A to implement the intervention. And then we use the second group as the comparison group. The comparison group is the group on the bottom uh, that does not have the symbol X between the observation one and the observation two symbols. Now it is important to remember to use the term comparison group and not control group. Control group ha does have very specific meanings in the research reporting. Remember that when writing up your reports. So in this example we take a test of group one on whatever our measure is you take a test of group two using the same measure, using the same instrument, and ideally at the same time, <clears throat> and then record those scores as your pretest. <clears throat> then we proceed with the intervention with group one. And either do nothing with group two or we continue on with whatever ser services they had been receiving prior to our intervention. This is often called giving the comparison group the quote treatment as usual option. Slide five. As we can see from this slide we have a number of options or variations in the comparison group design that we can use to make our research a little bit more robust. So in the top example, we use multiple 
pretests. What does that do for us, you may ask? Well, for one thing, it will give us an idea of any change from the first pretest to the second pretest. And we can compare <clears throat> the two groups. Then we go ahead and give our intervention to the treatment group. And continue on with business as usual with the comparison group. And then at some point after we complete the intervention, we compare the post-test results with um, the two groups. Also, we can give both interventions but stagger the delivery of them. So when using switching replications designs, we again take a pretest on both groups and then we give the intervention to one of those groups. And then we take a post test of sorts signified in this example as O2 or observation 2 and it is the first of two post tests. Then we proceed on and give the intervention to the group that didn't receive it before and follow that up with a post test of both groups. This gives us two different comparisons of our intervention. The first is a comparison of the top group to the bottom group. And the se second comparison is the bottom group at one time with the bottom group at another time. Also, it might give us some insight into how enduring our intervention is because the top group is measured again after a period of time without any further interventions. <clears throat> Slide 6. Here is an example of a multiple pretest design and how we would interpret it. So we can see at the point in time represented by observation 1 that both the treatment group and the comparison group scored 10. Indicating that they are roughly equivalent groups. Then at the second test, observation 2, we see that the treatment group has dropped to 6 while the comparison group has remained at 10. We follow that up with the intervention in the treatment group. And then we follow that up with uh, our post test, where we can see that treatment group has scored 4, while the comparison group remains at 10. So while the person who created this intervention may be jumping for joy, going, that is wonderful. I would say don't be hasty. <clears throat> what having the multiple pretests did for us was perhaps indicate that the two groups weren't so similar after all. The treatment group appeared to be on a downward trajectory anyway, having dropped four groups, four points before getting any intervention. So it is hard to say if the treatment group wouldn't have just continued that downward trend and been at four anyway. Now the same scenario. Except in this case it looks as though our treatment was in fact effective. We say this because we can see that at our first pretest the treatment group <clears throat> and the comparison group are roughly equivalent and at our sec second measurement they remain roughly equivalent. And the treatment group receives the intervention. Actually, 
<clears throat> and at the post test, they've dropped to four as compared to the comparison group, which still remained at ten. We just can't seem to get that comparison group off drugs, I guess. Slide eight. So here we have a contrasting replication result, and it is of an intervention that appears to be effective. We say this because again at the pretest, or as we should properly call it, observation one, <clears throat> both groups are relatively equivalent. Then the treatment group gets its intervention, while the comparison group, <clears throat> and, and at observation two we can see that it has dropped to four while the comparison group has remained at ten. So we turn around and give the comparison group the intervention and lo and behold it drops to four as well at the third observation point. <clears throat> For this trend, <clears throat> this tends to tell us that our intervention is being effective. And because there was also a period of time between the observations two and observation three, we might be able to start thinking that our in intervention has some staying power. And thank God we finally got that observation group off drugs. Finally. So here again we have the same scenario. But in this case it has different results. We can see that after receiving the intervention, the treatment group drops down to 4 from 10, but the comparison group maintained its steadiness at 10, even after receiving its intervention. So while we want to think that our intervention has worked, we can't quote unquote prove that. <clears throat> we can suspect that the comparison group was in fact not the same as the treatment group. We would also suspect that there's some selectious bias that went into uh, this. Most likely if we were doing this in an agency and we were wanting to, to prove that our intervention was worth the money we spent time and time we spent on it, we might subconsciously steer those clients who are more likely to succeed into the treatment group and perhaps put the more difficult to treat clients into the comparison group and it might not be so subconscious <clears throat> as well. Here we have a simple time series design that is just that simple. You decide what your measure is and you measure it and you measure it as many times as is reasonably possible. Then you give your intervention then you continue to measure the outcomes and see how your intervention has worked. The more that you can measure this outcome, the greater you will be able to say, be able to say that your intervention <clears throat> has worked or not. The multiple time series designs are like a blend of simple time series designs and the earlier comparison group models and here we can see that we just have multiple observations. One group gets their intervention and the comparison group doesn't. Then we proceed to make multiple observations again to see if there's a change not only between the experimental group before the intervention and after the intervention, but also to see if there are any change <clears throat> in the comparison group. Multiple time series designs and regular time series designs are relatively easy to do in agency settings, particularly if you're working with clients who are going to be with you for a while. Let's say they're chronically mentally ill. Typically in community support programs, every 90 days clients with a mental illness will have to see the psychiatrist to have their medications monitored. Typically during that visit, the psychiatrist or the nurse or even the social worker will perform some kind of routine assessment. 
<clears throat> let's say the global assessment of functioning, also called the GAF, or perhaps the nurse will do a test to determine their abilities and activities of daily living, often called their ADLs. The nice thing about this is that <clears throat> you may have many quarters of data already in the medical records and you would be able to determine if your client was all on an upward or downward trend. Then you just wait until you get enough observations to determine whether the trend has changed. Pitfalls in carrying out experiments and quasi-experiments in social services agencies. These pitfalls aren't just for experiments or quasi-experiments. <clears throat> they really are related to doing any kind of research at all in agencies. Oftentimes the administrators and the workers in these agencies do not fully appreciate the requirements of these research designs and will consciously or otherwise undermine the research process. So for example, there are many social workers out there with the mistaken notion that it is unethical to have control groups. They come from the point of view that if you're going to administer a new intervention, then everybody should have the opportunity to partake of it. And that being in a control group, rather <clears throat> I should say comparison group, since we are talking about quasi-experimental designs, would be arbitrarily excluding someone from a potentially beneficial service. <clears throat> that would potentially, that word potentially beneficial is the important point. Actually, it's a phrase. <clears throat> there is actually a greater ethical concern about doing the new and untested. There is, there is actually no greater, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> ethical concern about doing the new and untested intervention than there is in withholding that intervention from the comparison group. That is if providing the comparison group does in fact get the standard of care or business of usual type of treatment. In fact, since many social workers still use interventions that are not fully studied, it's arguable to say that if the business as usual treatment has not been demonstrated to be effective, then to deliver that service is unethical. Dicey stuff. <clears throat> when we hear the term cross-sectional studies, we try to think of survey research. Cross-sectional studies are characterized by having a study that is done at a single point in time. Now, not necessarily a survey. You can weigh somebody, for example, or take their blood pressure, and at a single point of measure, you, and that is a single point measure. So you get the idea. Cross-sectional studies are not good for causation, but they can have a lot of value when you're exploring a topic, trying to explain the phenomenon or to describe something. All that said, sometimes cross-sectional studies are used to attempt to understand causation by showing the association between variables. However, we can't establish true causation because we lack the element of time necessary in making that inference. We can, however, explore the possibility of there being causal relationships and point our research in the future at understanding those causations. Slide 14. Case control studies are quite interesting. When you think about case control studies, a good example that comes to mind is when public health workers or epidemiologists try to understand the appearance of cluster outbreaks of, the, say, say, a rare cancer. So they may look at one particular area as a case and <clears throat> they will compare that with a similar com community or area that has basically the same kind of racial and ethnic makeup, same kind of economic factors, and in fact try to match as many characteristics 
<clears throat> possible as they can and then look for differences. Quite often in the case of cluster cancers they will find that there is some environmental pollutant in the area where the cluster cancers are occurring and they will proceed from there. Oftentimes case control studies are very popular because the data already exists. <clears throat> it is just a matter of gathering um, and analyzing it. So while again we cannot establish causation, it can be useful in generating hypothesis. Although I would say, for example, in cases where environmental pollutants have been central to lawsuits and plaintiffs have won large settlements for the damages they have occurred, I would say that stance is pretty strong <clears throat> as establishing a causation. When a court of law says this has caused that. Slide 15. When we try to do experimentation within social services agencies, it is important to be aware that some common pitfalls um, to good research. What we mean by fidelity of an intervention is does every worker who is delivering the intervention do so in a way that is enough similar that we can determine that the difference between our treatment groups and our comparison groups isn't happening because of how the intervention is being delivered. Another common threat is called contamination and like the name applies something is getting adulterated by something else. In this case it is the control or the comparison group that is getting contaminated with the new intervention that the treatment group is receiving. This happens because, well, face it, workers and agencies communicate with one another. So even if we have multiple locations in different parts of a large city or county, those workers will still have some opportunities to interact with one another. And sometimes those interactions are quite intimate. So not only are co-workers getting together to play softball and have a few beers and basically socializing, and when they do they also end up talking about work and often since the only thing they have in common is work they talk about it to the exclusion of most other topics. Furthermore co-workers sometimes get intimate sometimes they get married and by that I don't mean being intimate and being married are mutually exclusive but a spouse working in one department may feel perfectly free to talk to his or her spouse in another department about their new intervention because they know that their spouse does not work in the same type of intervention or with the same type of population. However, the spouse that hears about the new treatment tells his or her co-workers about what's going on in the other department and then contamination starts to happen. Similar to the ethics concern I talked about earlier, Individuals often don't want their cases assigned to one group or another. Either they want their clients to get the latest and greatest, either because they want the best for their client or because they want to learn a new technique themselves, or just the opposite. They, liter they literally they oppose literally changing it all. They don't want to have to learn yet another thing. So problems with the client recruitment and retention aspects of your experiment can be exacerbated by caseworkers or the treatment team that the clients are assigned to. How do you avoid this? Of course, many of the pitfalls can be avoided with simple communication. Treat the agency st staff as true partners in your research process. Treat the consumer that way as well. Get buy-in at the earliest possible time <clears throat> will support your project. Also, don't just be the helicopter uh, in type of research. What I mean by that is don't be the type of researcher that only shows up to gather data and then disappears, only showing up again to give results. Interact with the agency staff. If they are the ones who are providing the intervention, keep close tabs on how the intervention is going for them. 
the best intervention in the world is not going to help a client if you can't get a staff convinced to deliver it properly. As much as possible, try to locate your control conditions in <clears throat> and your experimental conditions as far apart as possible. You might be better off for your research to use different agencies even if it means the treatment staff may be qualitatively different if you fear contamination will be a big problem. Developing a treatment manual, manual cannot be understated. If you're in the pract if you are in practice, you should have a treatment manual. Manual, no watch, no matter what you're doing, it's an indicator of best practice. So if you're doing research, you might as well model that best practice. Sometimes it's not possible to recruit clients on an ongoing basis, but if you have a type of type of treatment that is essentially um, uh, individual, that might be very possible. And finally. If you do a small pilot study before you do anything else, <clears throat> you will work out a lot of the kinks that are or bugs that are in your research protocol protocol before going into a full implementation. Other things that we can do, since we are research, we can act like ethno ethnographers in these institutions that we are doing interventions in to get a fuller understanding of how our research project is being implemented. Make every effort to go to staff trainings and supervisions. Staff meetings. Again, get to know your agency staff and the more that can be done in a naturalistic and informal way, the more they will buy into your research protocol. Practitioner activity logs and event logs. Use those only as needed. Practitioners are very busy people. They don't need yet another thing to do. However, if they already are keeping those activity logs, find a way to incorporate them into your um, qualitative analysis of your project. Conduct informal interviews. In addition to that, pull together some focus groups. Uh, that can be a good way to get staff together to discuss the implementation of your research. And be generous at these things. Bring coffee and bagels. Or reserve a place at Pizza Village and have your meeting in a friendly atmosphere. Now sn sn snowballing sampling, that's a good way not only to find clients but also to find collaborative staff. When we refer to the open-ended interviews with clients, we are not talking only about a research topic, but also about the process of our research. Having spot interviews with clients will help us understand how the intervention is being received by them. And finally, n know your agency. <clears throat> a kind of documents the kind of documents and manuals they already have and review them to see what kind of content is <clears throat> is in them. Excuse me. <clears throat> I think that's all for now. <clears throat> Experimentation is the gold standard of research, but it's hard to do in social services agencies because of the many practical barriers to doing a true experiment. However, we have many options available to create quasi-experimental research designs that can get at a lot of that information that we are hoping to understand.